Hi, everybody. Okay, why don't we get started? I hope everyone's doing well. Um, if I could ask everyone to please mute yourselves, that would be awesome. No, the people that are in the room don't have to mute yourselves, just the people online. It's not like all in the family where Archie used to say, stifle yourself, Edith, right? Okay, so we are um, studying the Kuzari and we're, we're learning about the, the phenomenon of prophecy. Um, and what Rabbi Yehuda Halevi wanted to try and point out, there were a number of points that he wanted to make is that the prophet understands or apprehends Hashem in a unique way that no philosopher is capable of understanding Hashem, which is the four letter name of God. And that's why we use the four letter name of God because we receive it as a tradition from our prophets. And the other thing that uh, he pointed out was, and that's something that we spent time on uh, the last time we met, was, which was two weeks ago. And that is that um, the phenomenon of prophecy can only exist within the borders of Eretz Israel. This is something that is Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's unique shita. A number of other rabbis disagree with Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, most notably the Rambam, who feels that prophecy is a universal phenomenon and is accessible to everyone everywhere because he has a totally different conception of what prophecy is. But nonetheless, the last thing that we left off with was about the prophet Yechezkel carrying over some of his prophecy into Babylonia because of his visions that he had in Eretz Yisrael. And we continue with this idea in paragraph, subparagraph 44 on page 415. He writes that this area, meaning the land of Eretz Yisrael, is superior. For when someone who has achieved the necessary Torah prescribed prerequisites for prophecy is there, he will see prophetic images with his own eyes in a clear image, not in riddles. Um, and this is uh, an important point that a number of commentaries make, that prophecy is different from having a dream. When you have a dream, you wake up from the dream. It may be a very vivid dream, but there are still things that you, start, you still have to figure out, you're not sure what it meant. When a prophet arouse, arouses from his prophecy, there's no ambiguity. It's a, it's a clear message. And we're learning in the Mora Nevuchim right now, we're learning the idea of prophecy as well in our Monday morning shir. And there the Rambam writes that even though sometimes the interpretation of the prophetic image is not mentioned in scripture, the prophet nonetheless understands the prophetic meaning. So for example, in the very first chapter of uh, Sefer Yirmiya, where God, um, tells Yirmiya about the, the destruction of the temple, um, he describes it as a pot that's boiling over, which is representative of turbulence, of something very tumultuous. Yeah, um, a boil, boil, toil and trouble, you know, it's, that's what the, the witches say, I guess. In other words, it, it represents something very turbulent that is about to happen. Scripture doesn't explain what it means, but Yirmiyahu understood what it meant, and that's what gives, that's what allows the Mephorshim to explain what it means. It's a little bit curious because the Rambam in his Mishneh Torah says that when Yaakov Avinu had the vision of the ladder, of the angels going up and down the ladder, he clearly understood the message, even though the Torah doesn't tell us what the message is. Now, if I were to ask you, what is the message of the angels going up and down the ladder? What would, you, what would you tell me? There are many different ways of understanding the story, but how, how, did, how do you understand the story? Do you remember anything from Midrash or? Okay, so the Malachi Eretz Israel ascending, the angels of Israel, the land of Israel leaving Yaakov because he had just come to the border. And then the, Mal the Malachim of Chutz Laaretz coming to his protection. That's not how the Rambam says that Yaakov understood the prophecy, which is sort of astounding how the Rambam knew that. The Rambam calls from a Midrash, which says that these were angels, these angels were actually four in number. And um, 
they represented the four traditional kingdoms that have dominated the Jewish people throughout Jewish history, you know, uh, Babylonian, Persian, uh, Greek, and Roman. And, um, and these four kingdoms uh, are sort of represented by these angels who go up the ladder and down the ladder versus representative of the fact that each empire has a certain period of rise, rise to power, and then a decline of power going down the ladder. And uh, so like the, there is a Midrash that says that the Babylonian angel went up 70 rungs on the ladder and then descended. The, that represents the 70 years of the domination of the Babylonian empire. And then the Persian angel went up uh, X number of rungs rep representing the years and the Greek, and then the Roman went up so many rungs that Yaakov couldn't even see how many rungs on the ladder it had ascended. So that is an indicative of the fact that the Roman domination was going to last for an inordinately long time, so long that even Yaakov couldn't tell how many years it was going to be. Um, and the Rambam says that that's how Yaakov understood the prophecy. It's a little bit difficult to understand how the Rambam could make such a bold statement when there are so many different midrashim that give alternate explanations as to what the message of the latter was. But nonetheless, what is what is being emphasized is that when a prophet has a prophecy, there's no ambiguity in the prophecy. The prophet is given a vision, and that vision represents a message, and the message is unambiguous. Okay, it's crystal clear in a clear image, not in riddles. These images appear in the same way Moshe envisioned the tabernacle, the sacrificial order, the borders of Canaan and the planned division of the land, the revelation of God passed before him and called out, which is from Parshat Ki Tisa, uh, after the sin of the golden calf, and in the way Eliyahu envisioned his revelation at that same spot in the book of Malachim when he goes up to Mount Chorib. <coughs> Now, what Rabbi Huda Levi is saying here is essentially that there's no difference between the clarity of a Mosaic prophecy versus any other Navi's prophecy. That's not so clear either. According to the Rambam, there's an even greater clarity of vision in Moshe Rabbeinu's prophecy because he needs absolute, un uh, nothing, uh, and nothing left to the imagination because he's giving over mitzvot, he's giving over the commandments. So if he's telling us how to build the Mishkan, he's got to know down to the inch or the millimeter exactly the dimensions of the Mishkan. There can be no room for ambiguity. But there are lower levels of prophecy that are made by prophets or achieved by prophets who are not giving over mitzvot that are not as crystal clear. But Rabbi Yehuda Levi does not make that distinction at all and, um, and, and therefore says that every prophet has that same crystal clear prophecy. I wanna go on and talk about why this is so important um, for us today, which goes back to Mrs. Sachachevsky's question, why are we spending so much time on prophecy? So the answer is, well, I think part of it will become clear in paragraph 45. So let's take a look at that. These prophetic experiences cannot be comprehended with logic. The Greek philosophers therefore dismiss them because logic rejects any phenomenon the like of which has never been seen. The prophets on the other hand, embrace the prophetic experience because they could not deny what they had been privileged to see with their spiritual eye. There were whole communities of prophets living during different times in history so that it is implausible to suggest that they conspired to lie about prophecy. Now, this is a common, um, a common theme that runs throughout the book Kuzari, which is the plausibility of the, of the tradition that we have of prophetic messages from Hashem. We uh, have always made the faith claim that it wasn't just single individuals who achieved prophecy, but multiple individuals and sometimes whole communities that achieved prophecy. The most, uh, the most uh, bold claim was that all of Klal Yisrael, when they stood by Harsinai, 
had this prophetic experience of Ma'amad Har Sinai, of hearing the commandments directly from God. No other Abrahamic religion, and not, uh, no other religion to my knowledge, has ever made the claim that God made a, a, a provided a mass prophetic revelation to a whole community of people. And because of that, Rabbi Huda Halevi argues vigorously, uh, you know, basically to claim that Judaism's faith claims are more plausible or more believable than the faith claims of Christianity and Islam, where it's only a select either individual or individuals who are privy to a revelation, right? It's only Jesus and his apostles who are privy to revelation. It's only Muhammad who's privy to revelation in a cave of the, of the work of the Quran, right? Whereas in Judaism, it's whole communities or Gans Kalal Yisrael. And so he's coming back to that just to talk about the plausibility of these prophetic experiences. It's not just one prophet. There have been multiple, multiple prophets living at the same time who, um, who were able to corroborate each other's prophetic experience. And then he writes, moreover, the sages living in their times who met them, found them to be authentic and bore witness to their prophecies. Now, this may or may not be a polemic against Christianity. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the Ramban at one time in his life had a very important disputation with a Christian cleric named Pablo Cristiani, who was a converted Jew. The Rambam had this disputation towards the end of his life in the late 13th century. Um, he, um, he was forced to, he won the debate, apparently. It was arguable whether he won it, but whether he won or he lost, he had to flee Aragon where he was living in Spain because when you win a debate as a Jew, you're in trouble, <laughs> so you have to leave. Usually the victor gets to stay, but not, not so with the Jews in the Middle Ages. So where did he flee to? He went to made Aliyah to Eretz Israel, and he was actually the most prolific in the last six or seven years of his life where he wrote his Torah commentary in the land of Israel right before he passed away. Um, and that's, you know, that's the legacy that we have of the Ramban, but he was extremely productive even before then with a lot of different writings, which we have in the Kitveha Ramban. And uh, one of those is his recording of his disputation with Christiani. And one of the arguments that he makes against, um, against his Christian opponent is the following argument. He says, our ancestors, the sages of Israel, lived during the lifetime of Yeshu, of, of Jesus. We knew him. We recognized him. He was one of our boys, one of our, one of our, one of our people. And he made these certain claims, and the great sages of Israel did not accept him. So that in itself is one of the reasons why, no matter how convincing you may be in your argumentation of, of why Jesus was the authentic Messiah or whatever else you want to, to depict him as, if Rebbe Akiva and Rebbe Meir and all the people who lived during that century, during that era, did not accept him, who are we to argue with the great Tanoim, the great sages of Israel who lived during his lifetime? met him, saw him, knew what he knew who he was, and still felt that he was inauthentic in his faith claims. Right? He said a lot of very profound things, perhaps, based on Jewish teachings, but to say that he was the Messiah, they knew that he wasn't the Messiah because they knew that the signs of what they knew what the signs of what is necessary to be a Messiah, and he was not it. Now whether or not Rabbi Yehuda Levi is making reference to that argument or not is unclear, but it's possible that he is. He lives, of course, Rabbi Yehuda Levi lives before the Ramban, but this could have been a very common line of argumentation that was well known in, among the middle age sages of, you know, of, of this milieu. And Rabbi Yehuda Levi basically says, one of the reasons why we grant authenticity to the sayings of the prophets is because the great wise men of our people who were alive at that time accepted them as prophets. And that in itself is also a reason why they, these people were acknowledged to be authentic prophets. 
And that's also a reason why we accept them today, because that's our legacy that was passed down to us. Okay, if the Greek philosophers had seen the prophets prophecy, prophesy, and their amazing qualities, they certainly would have validated them as well and would have sought ways using logical methods for man to reach that level. Some of the Greek philosophers actually did this. Now, what does he mean by that? Some of the Greek philosophers actually had encounters with prophets. We'll get to that in a minute. We can be certain that philosophers of the other religions mentioned at the beginning of the book did as well, meaning the philosophers that we talked about um, in the beginning of our book, where we talked about the initial meeting between the Khazar king and the, the Greek philosopher, we can be certain that many other people did as well. Or perhaps he's referring to Islamic philosophers. It's really unclear what he means in this last line, what other kinds of philosophers he's referring to. But what does he mean to say that we've had some of the Greek philosophers meet up with the prophets? We don't know for sure, but it seems plausible that Rabbi Yehuda Levi is making reference to a legend that is cited to be somewhere in some Greek writings that the philosopher Plato met the prophet Jeremiah in Egypt sometime when their lifetimes overlapped. So I wanna share with you something about this. Um, and I'm going to share my screen with you. Just give me one second. And while I'm bringing this up, I just want to make a point, and that is the reason why prophecy is such an important idea within Judaism is because it's really the cornerstone of our faith that God communicates to mankind via human beings. Without the Without this very important faith principle of prophecy, we really don't have a leg to stand on as far as claiming that God tells us what to do and that God has certain expectations of us. Because if God never made his wishes known, how in the world are we to know that A, there is a God, and B, that God, even though he exists, um, wants us to behave in a certain way or live our lives in a certain way. So that's really why prophecy is such an important topic of discussion. And it's one of the reasons why the Rambam codifies it as one of the 13 principles of faith. Because once you, if, if a person doesn't believe that God communicates with man, then on what basis do we make any claim about doing the right thing versus the wrong thing in God's eyes? Okay. Now here's the dilemma. The dilemma is the timeline, even if we're going to acknowledge, if we're, if we're going to find a story that Plato and Jeremiah ever met, we have to make sure that they lived at the same time. Um, according to the history books, Plato was born 420-something BCE and dies 347 or 348 BCE. So he's, in the, uh, he's living in the fourth century before the Common Era. Jeremiah is much older. He's born, according to the history books, around 650 BCE, and he dies in 570 BCE. So there's a discrepancy of nearly 200 years between the two. So if that's the case, then we have a real problem, right? So there's, I actually found there's a very interesting blog spot, um, a blog uh, called the Parsha blog, which dealt with this back in 2009. He writes as follows. As noted in the comment section, this assumes a non-Jewish dating system for the first temple's destruction, but the Jewish dating system is somehow missing about 165 years. There is a discrepancy between the Jewish dating system and the secular calendar by about 165 years. We're not gonna go into that now. There's been a lot that's been written to try and reconcile the two. But based on that, we can bring the destruction of the temple to about 420 BCE, according to the Jewish count. By adding 165 years to 586 BCE, which is subtraction, we end up with 421 BCE. If Plato meets Yirmiyahu after the temple's destruction, 
which then would be uh, Plato was born in, around in the 420s. So when the latter is in Egypt, Jeremiah is already in Egypt, then it does work out. We could, if we add 165 years to uh, basically 570 minus 165 is about, uh, is about the year 400 or 405, 410 is when Yirmiyahu dies, um, then maybe, it, maybe it'll work out. Maybe we'll get it to work out. Um, but it would have to be sort of like the last year of Yirmiyahu's of life and Plato is a young man, okay? So that's really the only way we can get it to work out. So where do we find this story that Plato and Yirmiyahu met? Uh, one of the first place that I'm aware of it is um, at least cited by a Jewish source, because apparently it dates back to an older Greek source, which I have yet to find. If anyone can find it for me, I'd be grateful. But uh, the Abarbanel in his commentary to Sefer Yirmi Yirmiya uh, in chapter one, verse six, writes as follows. The history books tell us that after the destruction of the temple, Yirmiyahu traveled to Egypt. And he lingered there for many years until he died, like the Rambam writes. The Chachme Hayevanim Meidim Shediber Imo Apalton de Mitzrayim. And the wise men of Greece testify that Plato met with him in Egypt. Lufi Ze Mehat Chalat Nubuato Admato Avru Yoter Mechamishim Shana. So there were more than 50 years from the time that Yeremiahu began prophesying until the time that he passed away. And he goes on from there. There is a very, there's a, a bit of a controversial sefer called Shalshelet Kabbalah, which is written in the 16th century by uh, Rav Gedalia Ibn Yahya. Um, and the reason why it's a little bit controversial is because we don't know exactly where Rav Gedalia received a lot of his traditions as far as his, his, the historicity of his claims. Um, He's, by the way, one of the, um, remember that story I told you about the, the Ibn Ezra was Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's son-in-law? Remember that story years back that I may have shared with you? That's found in Sefer Shalshelet HaKabbalah. Any story we find in Shalshelet HaKabbalah has to be taken with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, but he also mentions this story. And he writes as follows, Vikibalti mimori hagaon zekheni zatzal. He says, I have a tradition from my teacher, my grandfather of blessed memory, that he found in the commentary to the book Kuzari, which we're studying now, where there was a commentary written by a rabbi named Netanel Ibn Kaspi. And I don't, I'm not familiar with this commentary. I haven't found it. I don't even know whether it's in print. It may have been lost to the sands of time. Uh, Omer Amar Apalton, that he wrote in his commentary, uh, presumably on what we're studying now, that Plato said, Ani hayiti im Yirmiyahu bimitzrayim, that I was with Jeremiah in Egypt. Hayiti lo Initially, when I met him, I scoffed at him and at his prophecies. But eventually, when I became familiar with him, and I began speaking with him, and I noticed how uh, wise he was, and I noticed how pious he was in his behavior, I realized that he was speaking the word of the living God. Az amarti belibi. And then I accepted upon myself that really Jeremiah is both a wise man and a prophet. And the author of the work Torah Ta'ola, who is Rav Moshe Isserlis, wrote the same thing in his Sefer Torah Ta'ola. There's only one problem. It does not appear anywhere in this work called Torah Ta'ola. So 
again, as I tell you, you know, there's sometimes there are problems with certain authors as far as accuracy. So this is a very, very uh, interesting story. It's clearly something that Re Rabbi Yehuda Halevi must have heard about when he's alluding to this meeting between Plato and Yirmiyahu. It's somewhere found in some Greek writings. I don't know where. So may, uh, maybe one day I'll find it. If anyone discovers it before me, please let me know. Um, and um, just an interesting tidbit. I also want to point out before we move on that we're going to see later on in the Kuzari um, a very uh, important uh, sort of um, adjunct to this idea. Um, let me just see. Sure. The significance would be that there is a gen, uh, generally speaking, there is a tension between the philosophical community and the prophetic community. The prophet is a person who closes his eyes, has a vision, and speaks about his communication with God. The prophet, the philosopher, is the person who speaks with wisdom and professes to have the truth, but not through a, a supernatural prophetic experience, but rather through the machinations of logic and rationalism in his mind. And there's always that natural tension. As a matter of fact, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi talks about this very idea later on in our section. And that's just what I'm looking for right now, is that, and I've, I've made reference to this, there's actually a, um, uh, okay, it's, if you wanna find it, it's on page 443. We're gonna see it in a few weeks. It's at the end of, of paragraph 17. Um, and in this, he writes, it's on page 443 at the top, all those who pursue this divine religion follow these people of vision, these prophets. The Jewish people's souls are at peace in believing the prophets, despite, and listen to what he says, despite their simplistic messages and rudimentary parables. People are not at peace, however, in believing the philosophers, despite their deep teachings and their beautifully organized writings, and despite the proofs that they present to substantiate their words. The masses do not follow them. It is almost as if people's souls prophesy the truth, as the sages say, the truth is recognized. What Rabbi Huda Levi is alluding to in that very short little piece is that when you consider what is authentic, there's the art of rhetoric and the ability to be very eloquent in the art of communication. And then there's the ability to communicate something very deep and profound, but without all of the sophisticated rhetoric. And sometimes the two are in competition with each other as to which one will the masses follow? Um, I'll just give you an illustration. Do you remember the movie Amadeus from the, uh, was it from the eighties? Okay, it was, it was a, it, um, by, it was what is good, historical fiction about the life of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And he was in a, a rivalry with an older composer whose name was Salieri. Um, and in that film, what you, what, it, what you see depicted is this brash young man who lacks all of the sophistication of a Salieri in being able to go in accord with the protocols of formal musicology. But at the same time, when he sits down at the piano and composes a work, you, you, it's like you're hearing the angels play music. Whereas Salieri, when he would give a lecture about the art of music, would come across as very knowledgeable and sophisticated about understanding what music is all about. But his compositions lack the flair and the creativity of a Mozart. And the whole film was about sort of like the frustration of a Salieri recognizing that he is not a prodigy and he cannot compete with this brash Mozart 
can barely explain. He says, if you were to ask Mozart, how do you produce that music? He says, I don't know. I just hear it in my head and, I, and then it comes out. And if you ask Salieri, how do you compose music? He says, well, I think about the scales uh, of uh, and, and how the, uh, they conform to a particular order. And I try to, right? In other words, he gives you a very sophisticated lecture. Now, which music endures the test of time, Mozart or Salieri? And the answer is, is that even, no matter how sophisticated Salieri sounds in explaining his music, the music of Mozart is true beauty and therefore endures the test of time. It's the same thing in this battle, so to speak, between the philosopher and the prophet. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard of the, um, of the 19th century wrote about this as well. He wrote, he had a, he had wrote an essay about the difference between the philosopher and the prophet. He says exactly the same thing as Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. And he says that the prophet does not have the eloquence of a philosopher to explain how he knows what he knows. But he, when he has the vision and just describes the vision, the vision sort of portrays something very deep and profound, even though the communication of that message may sound much more simplistic. And that's the reason why there's this natural tension between the philosopher and the prophet. And it's sort of competing for the hearts and minds of the, commu of the intellectual community. So who would you rather follow? Do you, would you rather follow your Miyahu or would you rather follow Plato? That's really what it boils down to. And that's the struggle that Rabbi Yehuda Levi is dealing with in his own generation. Plato sounds uh, much more sophisticated than your Miyahu. Why should we follow your Miyahu? But when presented in this way, now you understand the idea. That's the, that, that's the, am I, am I answering your question? Uh, whether Plato came out after the whole discussion saying he understands how great in the other. That's exactly right. That's it. And that's the point of Shalshalat Kabbalah, which is to say that after they met, as simplistic and, and provincial that Plato thought that Yermiyahu was initially, but once he got to speak to him and get to know him, he realized what a, the depth of what he was really all about. Linda, go ahead, please. You gotta unmute yourself. There, okay, yeah, sorry. Um, to me, I don't know, when I think of this, for some reason, the thing that pops into my head is the comparison, be and it might not be related, but it's the comparison between um, like cre people who believe in the Bible and the creation of the world by God and people who believe in evolution and yes. the, conflict, the conflict like between them. So, but which, but in both cases, I think what, I don't know what Plato summarized in the end after his meeting, but it seems like it all comes down to an issue of faith. I don't know if, you know, faith was the reason there's people who believe in the Bible that God created the world and then there's the evolutionist and they're in conflict. It's not so much, I mean, it might be more in detail and they bring up all their proofs and this and that, but the biblical interpretation might be viewed as more simplistic, I mean, superficially. So yes, it, it's sort right. Of when, yeah, as, you, as you correctly point out, when looked at superficially, but remember, you know, the modern media today has that tendency to cynically dismiss any kind of religious faith claims by just saying how provincial and how primitive this thinking is. Now that we have science, we don't need any of that stuff, right? But what is neglected to, to mention in that argument is that science today still doesn't have answers for some very basic questions like, why do we exist at all? Why do we, why does, why does anything exist? And the fact that it does exist, why does it exist in the way that it does? Why do you and I think? You know, so there's not some of the most, and how did everything come into existence from if, if you know, so did Plato, did Plato, you know, like what was the result of that meeting where like, we don't know, say we, we don't know if they ever met. 
We don't know so, what the result of that meeting. All we what? know is, well, all we know is from this very small snippet from Shalshelet Kabbalah is that Plato finally assented to the greatness of Yirmiyahu. That's all mm -hmm. we know from listening to him speak. Yes. Hold on. Uh, Mrs. Sachachevsky makes a very interesting claim that Judaism is a very, what was the word that you used? Very intellectual faith and very intellectual religion. Um, first of all, I, I would immediately challenge you. And I would say, whose Judaism are you referring to? Well, I guess maybe, so that, that's sort of, what do you mean by intellectual? Do you mean logical? Okay, so there definitely, definitely the, the literature within our faith appeals, much of it appeals to people of logic, right? And therefore you would think that people who spend so much time debating logical issues would base their faith on logic. But at the end of the day, that's actually not the case. I'm not so sure that I agree. In other words, when, when, when I see the yeshiva put into practice, there's a certain segment of Torah study which demands rigorous, logical, critical thinking. And that's what we spend our time on when we learn about Ashor Shenaga Chesapara. You know, what do you do when an ox gores a cow? And who's liable for the damages? And that requires a lot of rigorous, critical thinking about what the halacha should be. But I'm not so sure that we, that in the yeshiva, the same type of rigorous, critical thinking is applied to issues of faith. As a matter of fact, I would argue that just the opposite, that what has been promoted over the cent over more recent centuries is that for matters of faith, accept it on faith and don't apply critical thinking to matters of principles of faith. That's the Rambam. Okay, the Rambam is, uh, is a unique character in all of this. You have to also remember that the Rambam was a came under great attack for his whole approach of leda, meaning use critical thought to come to a logical conclusion about God. For most of the other great Jewish thinkers, they basically said that you know God is unknowable and there's too much mystery behind this whole idea, and so. People like Rabbi Huda Halevi are more basically saying the prophetic experience transcends logic, transcends rationalism. And therefore, you know, and that's exactly the whole tension between the philosopher and the prophet for Rabbi Huda Halevi. The Rambam doesn't see the same tension. So much more to discuss. We'll hold it here in the Kuzari. We'll continue um, next time. Um, I'm going to share with you something about the Parsha now. So we bring that up. Okay, Parshat Yitro, share my screen with you. Okay, uh, the, the title of our Devar Torah today is Changing the Religion Paradigm. And it's my contention that, you know, in Parshat Yitro, we see the, um, we see the, the you know, the, the, the giving of the Torah takes place in chapter 20. Chapter 19, chapter 20 of the Parsha. Chapter 18 is sort of the prelude, the precursor to the giving of the Torah. And what is it? It's the story of Yisro, Moshe's father-in-law, coming to visit him, expressing his great joy and gratitude at seeing and hearing of all of the miracles that happened to the Jewish people. And also giving Moshe advice 
about how to answer people's questions. Moshe then sends his father-in-law away and immediately the Torah launches into the whole event at Ma'amad Har Sinai. Now, one could question what is the significance of juxtaposing these two stories together. If you were going to give a sort of a, 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 an introductory story to the giving of the Torah at Sinai, why would you choose the story of Yisro visiting his son-in-law Moshe? What is the significance? My belief is, um, and I believe I'm going to try to back this up today, that what the Torah is doing in a very subtle way is explaining to us how truly revolutionary the giving of the Torah was in world history of religion. In other words, not only was Muhammad Har Sinai unique in that it was a mass revelation, but it completely changed human beings' perception of why we should have a relationship with gods, G-O-D-S. What is the benefit of having a relationship with the gods? Now, if you're primitive man, what is the benefit of having a relationship with the gods? Anybody? Yeah, so it's, um, as Elaine correctly states, it's a, a utilitarian benefit. I want it to rain on my crops. The gods are in charge of, or the rain god is in charge of rain. So I need to pray to the rain god and offer sacrificial worship to the rain god so that I'll get rain. And if that is the view, that is the view of primitive man, of ancient man, as far as what the benefit of religion is. But in the Torah, there's something new that's being introduced, which is not having a relationship with your God for the sake of garnering benefit, utilitarian benefit, but the relationship itself is the benefit. And that's something that's quite foreign to ancient man. And what, what I'm trying, what I, want to, what I want to try to present to you now in the few minutes that we have is to show you that, in, that, that, that ancient man is in the guise of Yitro, Moshe's father-in-law. And what is unique about Judaism is something that Yitro cannot appreciate, which is that the benefit of the giving of the Torah is to have a relationship. The benefit of the Jewish faith is the relationship with God not the benefits that one garners for oneself as a result of appealing to the, uh, the, the God of the Jews. So I, I, want to, um, I want to look at just a few psukim and for us to get, to get an understanding. The Torah tells us that after Yitro comes with Sipora, Eshet Moshe, and Moshe's two children, the Torah tells us, Vayichad Yitro al kol Asher asa Hashem li Israel, asher hitzilo mi ad Mitzrayim. What is Yitro rejoicing over? He's rejoicing over everything that God has done for Israel. How God, the God of the Jews, Yud Ke Vav Ke, the name of the God of the Jews, how he has saved them from Egypt. Great and powerful God, a utilitarian God, a God that you'd want to sort of get cozy with if you really needed stuff, right? Vayomer Yitro, Baruch Hashem, Asher Hitzil Etchem, Miyad Mitzrayim, Miyad Paro. And Yitro says, blessed is this God of the Jews who saved you. Asher Hitzil Ta'am Mitachat Yad Mitzrayim, who saved you from under the clutches of Egypt. Atayadati, Ki Gadol Hashem Mikol Elohim. Now I know that the Jewish God is better than all of the other gods. He can do more for you. Than, than all of the other gods. Ki vadavar asher zadu alehem, that he paid them back with exactly what they tried to do to the Jews. They tried to destroy Jews in the water by drowning their, their, their babies. They were drowned in the Red Sea. And then the Torah tells us, as sort of like the end of that statement of Yitro, that what does Yitro do as a result? Vayikach Yitro Chotein Moshe Ola Uzvachim Leilokim. 
that Yitro took a burnt offering and a peace offering to God, peace offerings to God. Now, what's unusual about the first phrase in that puzzle? Like I have it bolded for you, right? What is, what is unusual? What, what word is unusual in Perik, in Pasuk Yudbet? Vayikach. So what, is, what does the word Vayikach literally mean? He took. Now, what, do you, what would you normally expect the verse to say? He offered. It should have said, Vayizbach Yitro, Chotein Moshe, Ola Uzvachim Lelokim. Or Vayakrev Yitro, Chotein Moshe, Ola Uzvachim Lelokim. Why does it say Vayikach Yitro? Yitro took. And the answer is, is that when you're a pagan, meaning, and I don't mean that in a derogatory sense, it's not a pejorative, but when you're an ancient person of religion, your belief is that there's a, the relationship that you have with your God is a quid pro quo relationship. I worship you, you give stuff to me. So Yitro is basically, after making his statement, now I recognize that God is the most powerful of the gods. What will I now do? I will bring an offering to that God in the hopes that what? I can get something back. And that's why the Torah uses the word Vayikach. Because Yitro literally views himself as taking something in exchange for this offering. Now, let's look at the second part of the Pasuk. Vayavo Aharon, v'chol ziknei Yisrael lecho lechem imchotein Moshe lifnei ha'elokim. Aharon and all of the elders of Israel came to eat bread with the father-in-law of Moshe before God. Now the word lechem doesn't necessarily mean bread. Lechem in Arabic means meat. And it's altogether possible that what it's re really saying is, is that they partook of the sacrificial animals that Yitro had offered. <laughs> but regardless of whether it means bread or whether it means the sacrificial meat, they are sitting down and dining with Yitro. There is a kasha that Rashi asks, which is, where's Moshe? Where's Moshe? Why does it say that Aharon and the elders sat down with Yitro and partook of a meal? Where is Moshe? Why is he not sitting down with them? There are a number of answers to this question, just to give you a few answers. The Midrash, and it's cited by Rashi in brief, but I quote, I wanna show you the Midrash just to give you the fuller, the fuller uh, flavor of it. It says, Umoshe atzmo hechanaya, where was Moshe himself? Ela milameid shahaya omeid umishamesh alehem. The, the answer is that Moshe was there, but instead of sitting down and eating, he served everybody. He was the, the butler of the meal. He was the waiter. He learned this from Avraham Avinu. As it says that Avraham stood over his guests as they ate. And Moshe felt, I should be just like Avraham. And by the way, this is a very powerful lesson, is that what the Medrash is trying to do is to tell us that Moshe Rabbeinu views himself as this generation's Avraham. I have to model the behavior of Avraham Avinu who, in whose merit we are receiving the Torah. And it's important for, for my people to see that it's, it's in Avraham Zuchus and his behavior and his chesed that Hashem is giving us the Torah. And the Medrash concludes by saying, Bahadrash Hazeh Darash Rabbi Yitzchak, Kisha'asa Rabbi Gamliel Su'uda Lachachamim, Bahaya Mishamesh Aleihem. And actually, historically, Rabbi Yitzchak came up with this idea when he saw how Rabbi Gamliel was once standing over the other sages and feeding them at his. Rabbi Gamliel was the Nasi, he was the president, he was the head of the Sanhedrin, and yet he served his guests. Okay, you got it. It's your perfect Devar Torah. Mrs. Sochachevsky, for those who couldn't hear, said, It's good to hear this as a woman. I'm not sure why, but I'm, I'm going to assume for a minute that what she means is that she's perhaps noted in certain homes that the woman is responsible for doing all of the service. And this is a way of. That's right. That's right. 
Good. Okay. The rush. <laughs> I leave that for you to tell your husband. Okay. The Rashbam, Rashi's grandson, and the Ibn Ezra both have a different answer to this question. Moshe, where was Moshe? The Rashbam says, Umoshe lo hutzrach lahazkir ki ha'ohel shalohu. Very simply. Why doesn't the Torah mention that Moshe was with them? Because it's obvious he was there. Whose tent is it anyway? It's Moshe's tent. So if you want to say who was there, you would say that Yitro was there. And then Aaron and the elders came in. You don't have to say that Moshe was there. It's his. It's like saying that I had some guests over my home. You know who was around my table? Yankel and Shmerel and Beryl. And I don't mention that I was there because it's obvious it's my table. Okay, so that's that's their answer to the question. The Sefer Meshivas Nefesh from the 15th century says that um, that Lahudienu Sheba Litvol Alpi Hadayanim Kemo Mishpat. The Imkain Moshe Haya Pasul the Dayan, that he understands that Yitro was coming to actually convert to Judaism. And this was a Sudas mitzvah that the Sanhedrin or the Bastin was having when a person converts to Judaism. They have to have a Lachayim, Wisham Mazel Tov. And Moshe couldn't be part of the Bastin. Why not? Why couldn't Moshe be part of Yitro's? Because he's a relative can't be on the member of the Basin if your father-in-law is converting. It's a very pragmatic answer to that question, right? And the Sefer Panim Yafos, which we won't go inside, it's a Hasidish Sefer from the 18th century. And it has a very, you know, it has a number of very profound statements about how Moshe, because at this stage he was about to receive the Torah, he wasn't eating at all. That's the reason why Moshe is not mentioned because he, was already, he had already become so ascetic and removed that he didn't want any food to be introduced to his body as he was preparing to ascend to Mount Sinai. This is shortly before, shortly before Moshe goes up to Shemaim. So he wanted to have his bowels completely like emptied so that there would be nothing impure within him. So like going for a colonoscopy, you know, you know, you want to be completely cleaned out before you go up to Shamayim to get the, to, you know, okay, in any event, all right. Now, my contention is that there's a different answer to this question. Why wasn't Moshe eating with Yitro? Because Moshe understood after having discussed with Hashem what the Torah was going to be all about, that this is a completely different concept of religion. You, Yitro, are offering to the God of the Jews because you view him as the, the, the most powerful of all the gods who can give you stuff. That's not what Judaism is all about. I love you. You're my father-in-law. You're the grandfather of my children, but you don't get it. And I don't want to participate in a sacrificial offering that is completely antithetical to what really the Jewish conception of offerings are to Hashem. We offer korbanot. They're not, by the way, you, you notice they're not called korbanot when Yitro offers them. Our offerings are korbanot from the word lihit karev to become close to. Our objective is to have the relationship. And this is actually, if you take a look, now perhaps we can understand why immediately after this story is the story of Yitro advising Moshe about telling him, you know, you don't need to personally connect to everybody. You know, um, what's the word? Delegate responsibility to lower judges so that the people will not get worn out and they'll be able to have their questions answered without having to stand online for an entire day. So when Yitro sees what Moshe is doing in verse 15, he asks, I mean, Yitro asks him like, why are you doing it this way? That you're the only person to answer people's questions. Moshe answers, Vayomer Moshe lechotano ki yavo elai ha'am lidrosh elokim. Because the people are coming to me to seek God, not to have their particular questions answered. If the milchik spoon fell into the fleshich pot, what's the halacha? It was their coming because they view me as the conduit to Hashem. They are a people who seeks God. 
And Yitro, not understanding that concept, says, you know, if they just want to get their questions answered, delegate that to other people. But Moshe has a difficulty with that because he views himself as God's representative, as the prophet of God to the people. And he says, what they're seeking is relationship. They're not just seeking the utilitarian benefit of having their questions answered. They are seeking God. And that's the reason why Moshe didn't think of this on his own. Okay, and then the last thing I wanted to point out, and that's the reason why it says, Before the Torah is given, Moshe sends his father-in-law away. Not because he doesn't like him, not because he doesn't want him around, but because after recognizing the dissonance between Yitro's understanding of religion and the Jewish understanding of religion, Moshe says, you're not going to get it. It's, this, this is not for you. I don't want to completely shatter your understanding of what faith is. So you go back to the shrines in Midian and we'll do our thing here. And then we look at what it does say in chapter 19, where God speaks through Moshe as to what the giving of the Torah represents. Number one, Moshe Allah El Elokim. Moshe ascends to God. All of the imagery in the text over here is describing the human being as connecting to the divine by going to God's place, not by asking God to come down to us and bless us. We go up to him to have that relationship. Moshe ascends to God. And God then says, Atem ri'item asher asiti lemitzrayim. You have seen all that I have done to Egypt. Va'esa etchem al kanfei nisharim va'avi etchem elai. I have borne you on the wings of eagles and brought you to me. I have brought you to up to me on the wings of eagles. Not that you see all of the things that I have given to you, but rather you see that as a result of leaving Egypt, you are now close to me. And if you listen to my voice, if you accept the Torah, if you, if you observe my covenant, you will be my treasure. Hashem is telling the Jewish people everything that will happen to me as a reason. I will, God will be enriched by having you as my people. Not that if you accept my covenant, I will give you stuff. I will bless you. I mean, that is contained in the Torah elsewhere, right? In Parshas B'chu Kosai, if you follow the mitzvot in B'chu Kosai, Te'lechu, if you follow the commandments, I will give you the rain in the proper time and, and you will uh, dominate your enemies and, and their enemies will flee from you and, and, and you will be secure and you will have peace and you will never be afraid and all, everything will be wonderful. But at this juncture, when it's time to introduce the people to what Jewish faith is, there needs to be a break from the Yitro-like ancient man conception of faith, which is, Serve me, take my Torah so that I give you things and I do things for you. That's not the message that Hashem is sending at this very incipient stage. You will be my holy nation. Not that I will give you rain, not that I will bless you, but you will be my people. We will have, you will be my children, my, my holy nation. That's what Hashem is doing. And that's the reason why the story of Yitro is here, because this, the giving of the Torah represents a complete break, a complete paradigm shift from the past of man's conception of religion. That's what I think is, that's why I think is the reason why the Torah prefaces this whole story of Matan Torah with the story of Yitro. Some quick questions. Korban Toda, was that not what Yitro was offering? Yes, he was offering a, an offering of thanksgiving, but it still says vayikach. He's taking it. Uh, is the, that's Karen's question. Is there not a difference between entreating the God before the issue with a bribe of an offering versus we who are encouraged to always be grateful for what has been given? Uh, certainly, certainly when we do receive the blessing from Hashem, we have to show gratitude. But the point that I'm making is that the emphasis of what Matan Torah is all about is a clean break from the conception of Yitro's form of worship. Okay, go ahead, uh, Rachel, yes.
Yes. Correct. Yes, there's a lot of discussion as to the timeline. Some say because we have a later story of Chalva Vitro in Sefer Bamidbar, and it is a lot of discussion. The Ramban talks about this a lot as to whether the two stories are the same story or two different stories, and whether Yitro stayed for Matan Torah or whether he left, which is the simple import of the text. That's correct, yes. The descendants of Yitro are considered to be the friends of the Jews, and they're called the Kani. Yeah, and they appear in Sefer Shoftim. That's right. Yael was a Kane. Yeah, she was from one of the descendants of Yitro, a very righteous woman. Exactly. Very good, Rachel. So, yes, there's a lot of uh, rich literature, uh, Midrashic tradition about the descendants of Yitro. But what we're suggesting is the opposite of that rich tradition. And that is that Yitro represents ancient primitive religion, and the Torah now is breaking from that. Okay, something important to take note of. Wish you a wonderful week. And we'll meet again. In, I'm for, I really am very sorry to have to tell you, I'm traveling again next week for a professional conference. And so I won't be here um, and I'll be back in two weeks. I apologize once again. Thank you. Okay, take care everybody.